Diluted EPS, an example. Raisin Inc. has the following, a 2020 net income of 1.6 million and a tax rate of 30%. 200,000 common shares outstanding as at January 1st, 2020, which had an average share price of $20 during 2020. 40,000 cumulative preferred shares outstanding as at January 1st, 2020, with a $3 dividend. Dividends on preferred shares have not been paid in 2019 or 2020. 15,000 stock options outstanding that grant the right to purchase one common share at an exercise price of $15. 5,000 convertible bonds outstanding, which can be converted into common shares at a 4 to 1 ratio. The bonds pay annual interest at 4% and mature on December 31st, 2023. They are currently trading at par. Raisin retired 40,000 common shares on April 1st, 2020 and issued 25,000 common shares on August 1st, 2020. Let's calculate the basic EPS. First, we'll note that the net profit available to ordinary shareholders is equal to the net income less the preferred share dividends. I'm going to pull up our facts from the previous slide so we can see side by side as we're going through this. So we start with our $1.6 million of net income, which comes from right here. And remember, we're looking at net profits available so our numerator must be after tax net income. And then we take our net income available to um, uh, for 2020 and we minus our preferred share dividends. So if you take a peek here, that is our $3 dividend minus our 40,000 cumulative preferred share dividends outstanding as at 2020. And because they're cumulative, even though there, there wasn't dividends paid out in 2019, because they're cumulative, we only take out um, what is due from this year. So what reflects the economic reality of what was due and payable to preferred shareholders in this year. And as stated in a previous topic, not what was outstanding um, or what was presently in arrears. All right, so now let's look at Waxo. Um, from January 1st to March 31st, so for three twelfths out of the year, we had 20,000 common shares outstanding and nothing changed until um, April 1st. So for three twelfths out of the year, we had 200,000 shares outstanding. Three twelfths times 200,000 equals a weighted average amount of shares for the year for the three months, January 1st to March 31st of 50,000. Then on April 1st, we retired, so we removed 40,000 common shares. So we went from 20,000 to 160,000 shares outstanding until August 1st. So for four twelfths out of the year, and sometimes I count my fingers, so I go April, uh, May, June, July, Look at 4 twelfths, great, 4 twelfths times 160 equals 53,333. Then on August 1st, and nothing else happened nope, um, from the rest of the year, so from August 1st, so August, September, October, November, December, for 5 twelfths out of the year, they issued 25,000 uh, common shares. So 160 plus 25 equals 185. 5 twelfths times 185 equals 77,083. Add up our weighted uh, shares outstanding for the year, and we have our WAXO of 180,416. And right before I take this number, I kind of do a sober second thought. So I take a step back and I'm like, hmm, okay. We started the year with 200, we took some away, added some back. What is, does this look right? Like if I ended the year at 185, um, does this does this feel right? Because if this number, for example, came to above two hundred thousand, I'd be like, mm, probably not. And if it came at the uh, below one sixty, again, I'd be like, mm, but probably not. So always kind of nice to take a peek at your own quants. All right. So now let's put it together. 
Our basic EPS is equal to our numerator divided by our denominator. And our basic EPS, our starting point for diluted EPS is $8.20. Okay, so now let's identify all potential common shares. So all PCSs. Looking at our case facts, we would see that we have our first financial instrument, we see are our common shares. So those are not PCSs since they are already common shares. Then we see our cumulative preferred shares outstanding. Okay, let me ask you, our cumulative preferred shares are those potential common shares? The answer is no. Um, if, they, if we had said cumulative convertible preferred shares, then yes, these would be potential common shares. But preferred shares on their own are not, uh, convert, are not potential common shares. They are just preferred shares. They are their own type of equity. All right. Okay. So looking at our denominator, our freebie shares, we would add the 15,000 shares that would be um, as a result of this exercise and then deduct the amount of shares required to purchase those in the amount of 15,000 shares times by our exercise price divided by our average share price. So we receive you know, the figurative, um, the potential dilutive effect of these stock options, of these potential shares outstanding during the year, would have been 3,750, which represents 15,000 less the 11,250. So our incremental EPS for this is zero divided by uh, 3,750. So stock options, when they're in the money, are always dilutive. And stock options, when they're not in the money, are not PCS because nobody would exercise them. Nobody would pay more money uh, to purchase a, price, a stock that they could just go out on the open market and purchase. So we rank our stock options as number one. We'll get back to that in just a moment. Okay, so looking at our convertible bonds, we had 5,000 convertible bonds outstanding, which can be converted into common shares at a 4.1, 4 to one ratio. And these bonds pay annual interest of 4%. So bonds versus our equities. So why does that matter? And why have I reminded you that the tax rate is 30%? Well, that's because the net income available to shareholders is an after-tax amount. So, and our interest paid to on our bonds is going to be a pre-tax amount. So we need to take something that's pre-tax and make it into an after-tax amount. So we would be saving, if these had been exercised throughout the year, we would have been saving all of this interest that was paid. So 5,000 convertible bonds, they are paying out, um, they are worth $1,000 a piece and they are paying a 4% interest but we wouldn't get the tax benefit from this, so we would add back 140,000 to our numerator. And had these been exercised, pardon me, had these been converted throughout the year, we would have had 5,000 uh, convertible bonds, which are convertible into common shares at a 4.4 4 to one ratio, so we would have had 20,000 shares added to our, new, our denominator. We then rank by the most dilutive, Stock options are always the most dilutive because they have zero to the numerator and a number to the denominator because we look at in the money stock options. And so as such, most dilutive stock options, second most dilutive, the convertible bonds with their incremental EPS of $7 per share. We now adjust basic EPS. We take that and we add into and factor in our incremental EPS for the stock options. So adding zero to the numerator and 3,750 to the denominator, which gets our first calculation of diluted EPS of $8.04. Then we rank that current diluted EPS against the next most dilutive PCS, 
which is the $7 from the convertible bonds, because $7 would make $8.04 look worse, we add in the effect of the convertible bonds. So we just layer in the next. So an increase to the numerator of 140,000. And then we add into the effect the 20,000 additional common shares to the denominator. And we recalculate this whole thing and we get a total diluted EPS for $7.93. At this point, we are all out of PCS, potential common shares, so our diluted EPS for Raisin Inc. is $7.93. A question. Which the following is the least dilutive when considering incremental EPS? Would it be A, stock options, B, convertible preferred shares, or C, contingently issuable shares? The answer is B, convertible preferred shares. Both A and C, both of stock options and con con contingently issuable shares, uh, only they're uh, always dilutive effects because they have an impact to the denominator, but not to the numerator. When we when stock options are exercised, they do not have a net income impact. Same with our contingently issuable shares. However, with convertible preferred shares, there is a numerator impact. So that is why they are always the least dilutive amongst these three. Thank you so much. This does it for this chapter and I'll see you in the next.